Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. I don't know if everyone can see the PowerPoint. I cannot. Um, let's see if I can pull it up. Should I be able to see the, the PowerPoint? Here we go. Okay. All right. Hopefully everyone can see the webinar PowerPoint. We're so glad that you're with us today. We are going to be talking about enhancing collaboration between child welfare and early childhood systems. This is a collaboration between the Florida Institute for Child Welfare, where I am the director, and we are partnering with the Office of Early Learning on a series of webinars to really equip and enhance our workforce, the workforce for child welfare and the workforce for um, early childhood education. So next slide, I just want to do a quick overview of our speakers. We have Joan Lombardi, who is the Director of Early Opportunities. And at the beginning of the webinar, she's going to do some remarks about um, just the importance of this collaboration and also kind of her landscape of things at the national level as it relates to why this is so crucial. Then we're going to talk to Samantha the director of the Office of Child Care Regulation right here in Florida. And she's going to take us through child care regulation, but also a project that's looking at trauma-informed child care. And then we're going to end with Erin Huff, who is a prevention specialist at the Department of Children and Families. And she will be talking about what is child welfare and the Roya Wilson Act, because we really want to educate both the workforces on what the other workforce does. And now that I said that, I think I've reversed the two. Aaron's going to be the second speaker. Samantha will um, end it. And at the end of the webinar, we're going to have a Q&A. And we hope that you'll engage on asking the speakers questions. They are experts um, in their respective topics. And you are allowed to use the raise, raise hand feature on your computer. And we also want to make sure to tell everyone who's logged on to mute themselves so that we can keep the background noise to a minimum. Okay, so if all of the housekeeping for the webinar is taken care of, I'm gonna pass it over to Joan Lombardi to begin. Great, well, thank you. Um, if I could have my slides up, that would be terrific. Um, I am really delighted to be here. Jessica, thank you for your leadership on this. This conversation, connecting early childhood and child welfare, is actually happening in states across the country. And almost every early childhood meeting I go to lately has a session on this topic. And I think one of the reasons is these two sectors, although they're often talked about separately, are really natural allies because they are both concerned about the conditions facing children and families today. So if I could go to my first slide, um, we are talking about linkages between these two systems. Um, we know that what happens in the earliest years of life lays the foundation for long-term health, learning, and behavior. That's one of the reasons why it's so important to link these systems. We know that the challenges and the risks that families are facing all over the country, poverty, inequalities, stress, maternal depression, substance abuse, the list goes on and on. And we also know that often these challenges are facing the same family. Unfortunately, what the data is telling us now is that children under three have the highest rates of child maltreatment and that infants make up the fastest growing group of children in the foster care system. So given those statistics, we can't ignore the fact that the early childhood system and the child welfare system have to be working together on behalf of the youngest children. If we turn to the goals of each sector in the next slide, and as Jessica mentioned, you'll hear a little bit more about each sector when the other speakers <clears throat> are presenting, but just a quick overview about each sector. When we talk about early childhood, we're promoting child development and child well-being. That's our goal. And we're doing it in early Head Start, in Head Start, in preschool, 
in child care, in home visiting, and in early intervention programs, among others. But those are our main programs, um, both at the federal and the state level. In child welfare, our goal is also promoting safety, permanency, and child well-being. So we have related goals, and we work through the child abuse prevention and intervention system, foster care, and adoption. Both sectors have an important role in supporting strong families and promoting child well-being for young children, although, of course, the child welfare system <clears throat> spans the entire age range. But given the facts that I mentioned before, that we've got this dramatic increase in the number of young children entering this system or at risk of entering this system is another reason why these sectors have to come together. If we turn to my last slide before we turn on to the next speakers, quality early childhood programs have an important role in child protection. They play a preventive role by reducing the risk factors and increasing the protective factors. Early childhood programs themselves can be an, an important protective factor for children and families. They also play an important role in identification and reporting of child abuse and neglect, and we need training and support to make that happen. They play an important therapeutic role, um, quality programs do. So they're an intervention for the family that is um, in the child welfare system and the foster care families to reduce stress and to provide respite for those foster families. And of course, they play an important role in creating awareness of the importance of young children and families in the judici judicial system. And we have an increasing number of judicial um, system supports so that those people involved in the judicial system and the judges and the, and the attorneys that are involved in those families become more sensitive to the special needs of very young children and their families. So, you know, among many other reasons, the quality early childhood programs are, should be seen as an important mechanism to protect children. So I'll stop there and turn it over to our next speaker. Good morning. Uh, my name is Erin Huff, and I work for the Florida Department of Children and Families in the Office of Child Welfare. Uh, my work here is done in the policy and practice team, and what we do is we work on statewide issues. Um, we address um, policy needs. If there are statute uh, changes or, or we have needs around statute, we, we work on that, and administrative rule changes. Um, oftentimes, we'll complete specialized reviews of casework across the state and look for trends in areas uh, that need additional action um, and, and focus. I also work here on prevention efforts and manage federal grants, which fund a significant portion of the work that DCF does across the state. Next slide, please. So the importance of quality early child care for the child welfare population. Uh, children involved in the child welfare system face many challenges. Uh, they may have experienced abuse, abandonment, or neglect. They may have housing insecurities and have witnessed violence in their own home or a myriad of other maltreatments. Early child care can serve as a mechanism for detection and early intervention. Um, we all know that teachers and staff spend a significant amount of time with the children enrolled in their centers. Often, they may be the first to notice concerns or changes in the child's behaviors or even positive um, things that are happening with the child. We all know that children under three who have been neglected are, are at a significantly higher risk of experiencing a developmental problem. This makes quality child care all the more important. Uh, child care can operate in a prevention capacity for families. There are many times that teachers and providers model, maybe even without realizing it, and educate on appropriate behaviors and actions, and they can serve as a critical linkage to other uh, early intervention programs. When parents come in to pick up children or have interaction with teachers and staff, uh, they get tips and information, oftentimes without the, the teachers or the staff even realizing they're doing it, and it's critical. Um, 
The relationships formed by the parents and caregivers with professionals providing the child care services, they're an invaluable resource. Child care providers um, provide important increased visibility for our vulnerable children. So with, without a child going to a center or uh, to child care, they're not visible. We don't know what's going on in their lives, and we don't see them day in and day out. So this is a critical linkage. Um, it provides increased visibility and safety and security for our children. Uh, as it was mentioned before, the child welfare system and early child care share many similar goals, and we all want a positive outcome for the children we serve uh, in both systems. And this is best achieved when there is timely and ongoing communication. Uh, when the needs of a child and their relevant history are shared with each other. So if, I have a, if I'm a child welfare for professional and I have information that is relevant to the child care center and the staff, I should share that. Um, that increases the, the services that are afforded to our children, the interaction with their staff and uh, teachers. Next slide, please. So the Aurelia Wilson Act, um, it's Florida Statute 39.604, commonly referred to as the Aurelia Wilson Act. Um, it requires children who are under court order protective supervision or in an out of home care uh, setting that they be enrolled in an early education or child care program. Uh, and if they're enrolled, they must attend five days a week unless the court grants an exception. Exceptions may be granted for several reasons. Um, they're not often granted to be honest with you, but it can be granted um, if a caregiver is a stay-at-home caregiver or works less than full-time. Uh, this act, the Rodeo Wilson Act, uh, requires some uh, reporting around attendance. So if there are um, consecutive unexcused absences or seven excused absences, um, a notification to the case manager or case management agency is required. And this should uh, prompt a visit by the case manager. So the intent of this act is really to mitigate the increased risk of poor school performance and other behavioral and social issues as a result of uh, prior maltreatment. The legislature recognized that quality child care can help um, ameliorate the negative consequences of abuse, neglect, and abandonment. We, we know and having been a child well professional and in the field for many years, that the information provided via child care is very useful. The information obtained via observation and assessment is extremely beneficial when child welfare professionals and courts are making decisions regarding a child's well-being, safety, and permanency. We really couldn't do our job without the information that child care professionals have. Next page, please. I've touched on it, but collaboration is key. Um, our goals are similar, our populations overlap, and we can then work together to improve outcomes for vulnerable children and their families and be a support for caregivers. Uh, children who are involved in the child welfare, welfare system need as much consistency as possible. And oftentimes, this is found at school. You know, a stable routine day in and day out can help children and improve outcomes. Um, one thing to keep in mind is again the sharing of information. So many times information is lost or not shared between professionals or between professionals and caregivers. Um, this information can be very valuable as a child moves um, to new settings or you know court cases navigate through the child welfare system um, as decisions are made regarding well-being and permanency. Um, if a child is going to leave a child care setting, you know it's important that we share assessments and observations. Um, that can be helpful to the new child care providers, to the new placement, if the child is moved to a new foster home or a relative, non-relative caregiver. But communication is key. Um, I've said it before, you know, encourage communication between the parents and caregivers and the child care staff, and also child care staff and caseworkers, if there's one involved. Um, you know, not always do we have concerns. We may have some really uh, positive information that should be shared. Maybe a parent or a caregiver has made um, some significant steps um, to engage the child care center or to come and visit and um, you know, spend time with their children. And that information needs to be shared. It's also very important. 
I would encourage that staff obtain uh, the contact information for caseworkers or their supervisor. Sometimes caseworkers may change, um, but if you have a supervisor's uh, name, number, and email address, you know, you can work through that a little bit easier. So I would encourage um, telephonic communication or face-to-face -face communication, but emails are also, um, you know, very helpful if the information being shared is not urgent. So with that, I will uh, pass it over to Sam. Good morning. Hi, my name is Samantha Vashtasega. I'm the director for the Office of Child Care Regulation with the Department of Children and Families. And to piggyback on the previous two presenters, um, it is a collaboration. Our office is charged with the oversight um, to ensure the environment that children are attending um, is a healthy and safe environment. And it is also helping our providers be successful um, in moving forward and helping the families that they serve. Next slide. In doing that, it does take a partnership. It does take a collaboration between not only the different departments within the Office of Department of Children and Families, but also within the Office of Early Learning. The department and the Office of Early Learning have been working in collaboration on multiple projects um, to help child care providers, but also help parents, help foster parents, and to help child care providers when looking for child care. And one aspect that we took on or one project that we began with was trauma-informed care project um, that we have in place. There's currently three phases. The first phase we have completed and it's with regards to an endorsement. And this is getting information um, to the level of the directors of child care facilities. It's a multitude of courses. It's a one five-hour course, which is a basic overview of trauma-informed care. It then um, leads into a 40-hour instructor-led course um, for trauma-informed care to delve in more information going forward. And once um, directors complete this course, they can earn an endorsement um, recognized by the department that they are a trauma-informed care um, director. We currently have three classes that are in session. Um, we have one in the northwest, northwest, central, and southern regions of the state. That is phase one. Phase two, we're working in um, partnership with the Office of Early Learning with us a trauma specialization. We anticipate completion of this by 2020. The specialization will um, delve down into the actual child care personnel working in the classroom, obtaining specialized training in trauma-informed care to help them when working with children. Phase three will be a badging, a badging for these programs um, based on the phases one and two completion of training, that if a facility or program reaches a certain level of staff that have trauma-informed um, endorsements and specialization, they will receive a badge um, in identifying that the program has is trauma-informed care, which will be available to the public to view on our website. So when they're looking for child care arrangements, they and they foster parents or maybe caseworkers um, where a child is going into an early child care setting can look for programs that have this trauma-informed care training and understanding for possibly the best placement for the child in a child care setting. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about our project, the Trauma-Informed Care Project. Next slide. So our project goal is to ensure that our child care providers have the skill and the knowledge that they need um, to offer the most developmentally appropriate care for children, especially those that may have experienced trauma and trauma coming from whether they, if they are part of the child welfare system or trauma that they've experienced in their home life. The, the overall goal of the project is to reduce preschool suspension and expulsion. Um, it's shocking, but that is occurring statewide where preschoolers are being um, suspended for behavior issues. Also, we want to provide access to prevention and early intervention lead, um, resources so the providers will have information um, within their wheelhouse, their toolbox that they can provide to families and their staff when working with children. And we want to um, create a trauma-informed care infrastructure for our providers, our children, and our families in the community that we serve. Next slide. 
so some examples of stress that we that children and your staff or staff working in the child care settings may experience um, physical emotional abuse, chron um, chronic neglect, hungry, hunger, malnutrition, um, natural disaster, discrimination, racism, incarceration of a parent or detention of a parent um, or a spouse. Substance abuse, mental health, exposure to violence. If a parent, um, if the child's parents are getting divorced or separated, that can cause stress to the children. Um, family economic hardships can also cause issues for the children to experience a level of stress, which all result may be in their behaviors that they're exhibiting um, while they're in care at child care setting. Next. So there are different levels of stress, and not all levels of stress are toxic. Um, there are certain normal stress that we have in the day-to-day -day, um, events of life. There's tolerable stress. Um, this can be managed through having the appropriate coping skills that are facilitated by the supportive adults, and that's really the goal of our um, project, the Trauma-Informed Care Project, is putting those tools in the hands of our caregivers that are in the early childhood setting that they can help children in care handle um, their levels of stress, whether it's tolerable or toxic, and they have the right tools and are there as a buffer to help protect that child and provide support, support to the child so the child can continue in the early childhood setting and feel fostered, um, fostered in support so they can work through the toxic stress um, or the tolerable stress that they're experiencing. Next. And this was really shocking. When we started down this road um, for the Office of Early Learning and the Department of Children and Families, it was with regards to that children were getting expelled from preschool at three times the rate of those in K through 12 programs. And as a result, we believe of teachers not understanding the true underlying issues of some of the children's behaviors that are exhibiting and not having the right tools or the, the information to help them be successful in helping children work through their trauma. Next. So part of the um, trauma-informed care is giving them the tools that they need in their toolbox to work through. The, um, and working with the children that are in their care, um, making sure that they have coping strategies um, for children um, and for themselves, making sure sufficient sleep, um, they have sufficient sleep, exercise activities where children can exert some energy. Um, as a caregiver themselves, they may experience trauma in their personal life that they bring into the early childhood setting, but also having um, staff, friends, and there at the early childhood setting program that will help them work through that. Um, having someone that can um, help a struggling employee going through those challenges and working with the children. So the next slide is basically how we are creating a trauma-informed child care program in the state. Um, this is how we envision that it will work for child care settings. Um, the caregiver and Caregiver training, which is the trauma-informed care and the understanding that they have to take care of themselves also. So self-care, building partnerships. This is the partnership that where we're building with outside entities outside of the department to foster this trauma-informed care creation. We've been working with the Office of Early Learning, other community partners um, for curriculum development and setting forth the badging and the specializations as we go forward for programs to participate if they would like. Um, culturally responsive, understanding several factors um, just that may impact what is occurring in an early childhood setting and in the child's life and in the community and um, working with the organizations, families, and individuals to reduce ba um, barriers, address social uh, adversity, strengthen facilities, encourage positive um, identity. Collaborate across systems. We can't do it alone. We need to bring in out, um, working with our child welfare partners, 
um, our foster parents, our families, and bringing them into the system so we are understanding everything that is occurring. Um, the partnerships, as I said, with the um, child welfare, our pediatricians and therapists also bringing them in the loop to understand what's occurring within the child care setting and the staff and their training levels. <coughs> and we all want to look through a trauma-informed lens um, in programs. As I mentioned earlier, um, the expulsion rate of children is really high in preschool, which is alarming. But we also need to be looking through at that child and that child's family and, and the issues that are happening and the information, as Erin shared, that we're receiving from um, their caseworker, from their foster parent or their families of the events that are happening. Um, that information needs to be shared with the teachers who are working with the children on a daily basis to ensure that they understand what may be the underlying issue of a child's behavior, whether they're acting out or they're withdrawn um, or they don't want to be engaged with others. So um, that information is vital to help that child in the child care setting, um, teachers being in the supportive role to help children deal with the trauma that they've experienced. Next slide. And if you could click one more time on that slide. So I just wanted to give you an overview of our trauma-informed care project and how it has unfolded over the last um, two years. One more click, please, on the slide. Okay, or a couple clicks. So we started out with the trauma-informed care child care professional course. Um, we started out with this course in 2017. And basically the plan was just to give an overview of trauma-informed care. So providers and staff would have just a basic overview knowledge of what may be contributing to some of the behaviors that they see of children in the child care setting um, and to help them be better informed. From there we went to the next. If you could click the slide, please. Um, we went to, after the five-hour course, we got um, tremendous feedback from child care facilities and participants, they wanted more. They wanted more information on trauma-informed care. They felt that this was vital to their programs and their teachers to help the children in their care. So we created the 40-hour instructor-led training course um, that is now available. Those are the three, we have three classes that just kicked off. The course was released in July. Um, and so this is an additional 40 hours where um, directors or anyone can go in and take to have more information about trauma-informed care. Could you please click the slide? So what that will lead to is we wanted to be able to give something to providers so they would have to demonstrate that they had gone above and beyond by taking these trauma-informed care courses. And so we will, um, the department, will issue a trauma-informed care director credential endorsement on the training transcript to anyone who has completed the part one, which is the five-hour course, and the 40-hour instructor-led course. Um, they will receive that endorsement um, on their training transcript. Going forward, next click. That trauma-informed care endorsement will lead towards, as I mentioned earlier, the specializations that we're working with the Florida Office of Early Learning, which will be more in-depth training for the staff that are in the classroom. It will be formal and informal training that they can um, complete as part of their um, professional development moving forward. At a certain level, the programs will depending on the number of staff that participate in this specialization. One more click, please. Will lead to the trauma-informed care badge that I mentioned earlier, which we hope to launch around July 2020. Once a child care facility has met the threshold of specialization and endorsement, um, there will be that badge that will be um, placed to the provider profile that is available on our um, child care website. So when families are looking for child care settings, whether it be the foster parent or a family that um, may not be under the radar of the department, but their family has experienced some type of stress or trauma, 
and they need a setting that is that has the capabilities to work with their child to be successful, they can identify that trauma-informed care badge will be available and will be one of the services or options that they have available when choosing the best child care option for their family. Next slide. So the trauma-informed care endorsement, this is something that the department has taken on um, under our new administration. We were to identify one goal that will help um, ensure that the families that we're working with is try to create a more preventative type atmosphere instead of a reactionary type atmosphere for the department. So our program, it has chosen a goal to increase the number of child care professionals with the um, trauma-informed endorsement by 2021. Um, for the programs, it details, as I mentioned earlier, the five hour, the 40 hour, and then they can earn their trauma endorsement. Not only will they be a trauma-informed center, but they will also be able to use this type of training um, that they've completed to meet some professional um, contribution requirements for a director credential renewal. We've also partnered with the um, Children's Forum Teach Scholarship, who will help child care providers pay for the 40-hour instructor-led course and the five-hour course um, that they will be taking if they are utilizing it to renew a staff or director credential. So we partnered outside of the department to assist the program, search early childhood settings and how they could utilize this not only to educate their staff to deal with children that have experienced trauma and are their staff, but also how they could um, link this to other requirements, licensing requirements that they have with regards to staff and director credentialing. Next slide. Okay, so this is, um, if you have any questions with regards to the trauma-informed care and how we're working in collaboration with our um, community partners, the Office of Early Learning, um, with our Office of Child Welfare partners to ensure that the early child care settings around the state um, and the staff working with the children and the families um, have the tools they need to be successful. They are a partner. Um, they are a valuable partner in working with these families and the children especially to ensure that they are getting and their needs are being met um, based on their experiences that they've come into care for. And that's so, it for me, Jessica. <laughs> so this is Joan again. Thank you so much for Samantha and Aaron for that wealth of information. And it's very exciting to hear about trauma-informed care. <clears throat> and I was happy to hear you talking about the workforce because both in the child protection area and in the early childhood community, our own workforce is under tremendous stress. So we have to continue to support them. Um, it's really wonderful to see the two departments working together at the state level. Could either of you talk a little bit about, at the community level, I know there are community readiness councils and a variety of other collaboratives at the local level, how they also may take this issue on and trauma-informed care, but other ways that at the local level, there could be bet more, even more collaboration. Well, this is Samantha. In our course curriculum design, um, we, our vendor reached out to multiple sources in the community to help with that um, curriculum build. We continue to promote our trauma-informed care through multiple county um, and local avenues. Um, and then we invite, their, we invite their participation. Our course is not limited to child care providers. We have opened it up to um, others. And so I know recently we worked with the local foster care licensing unit who, have asked, who are having their um, local staff take our trauma-informed care course that they felt that was valuable, that may be valuable information for them as they're working um, with the families that they serve. And is there special outreach to foster parents in the child care system, Erin? How, how do the foster parents, what's the status of foster parents and the child care system? 
in the state? Yes, there are many different initiatives um, that involve our foster parents. Um, we've um, included them on a local level as well as a statewide level in discussions um, around uh, child care um, and the needs of our children. So they are at the table um, very often um, as it relates to the needs of our children and their own needs. Are there other questions coming in? Yes, there are a couple of questions, not exactly um, to the point that you were talking about now, but we can go ahead and answer them. Um, the first question was wanting to know about getting the several questions were about getting the recording or copies of this presentation. And the answer to that is yes, we always send the link out with notes and resources after the calls. And so it may not be also with a, a link to an evaluation. That may not be um, today, but it'll be before the week is out. You'll receive um, a copy of this information, be it the link to the recording, along with other resources, as well as a link to the evaluation. So other questions are, how do providers apply for the sessions for the trauma endorsement opportunity? Okay, this is Samantha. So um, there's for the applying for the scholarship funding to utilize for the purposes of a staff or director credential renewal, um, that will be through the children's forum. To sign up for the courses, they will go through the department's training um, system um, and sign in for, they can access the online course there to register, and then for the instructor-led course through that training system as they do with most, um, with all DCF and um, some of the Department of Office of Early Learning's courses. Another question was, are the phases voluntary for the child care programs? Are any of the trainings required? Um, for the department's purposes, they are all voluntary. This is up to um, the child care provider to utilize it as part of their professional development. It is not mandated that they take or required that they take this course from the department. Next question. With public schools, there are processes that a school must go through before a child can be expelled for behavior, et cetera. Is there any consideration for developing this type of process for the child care setting? I can talk for the licensing side of the house. Um, there is not conversations to put that um, such a prescribed measure into place for licensed programs. Programs are now required to have expulsion and suspension policies, um, written policies in place that they share with families, and that's something we monitor for to make sure that they have that policy. But the criteria that must be reached before a child can be expelled is not something that we um, we require within the licensing piece. We're hoping through this trauma-informed care um, with putting this information, this understanding in the hands of the child care providers that they will be better able to deal and work with those children and and that result, like if their behaviors are resulting in them being expelled or suspended from school, that the teachers are able to work, recognize an issue so that child can stay in care. That's the ultimate goal that we have on our end. But, um, to answer that question, no, sorry, that was kind of long-winded. <clears throat> we don't have any special criteria that has to be met or a threshold before suspension can occur. This is Joan, but I think that that's, you know, the direction of training staff is exactly the right direction. We know, I mean, we have to think about why are children being, you know, ex expelled at this alarming rate, and part of the reason is training and support of the staff. You know, they're um, giving them the kind of working conditions that can support their being able to deal with the stress on a daily basis that they're feeling around children. I also think that what we've seen across the country is, you know, any kind of mental health supports that you can give to the child care community 
so that on an ongoing basis, they're better able to cope with the issues that they're seeing, because there's really no excuse for expelling young children. We just have to be very clear about that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we want to give people supports so that they can deal with the issue appropriately. Other question? Next question is, how to access the trauma-informed training for non-child care staff interested in accessing for ELC staff? For the department's courses, it, you go through the department's child care training um, system and you access the, um, the course by registering for the online and the instructor lab through that avenue. And the preschools also are eligible for that, Erin and yes. Samantha? So in Head yes. Start. In, anyone, it's, it's open to anyone. It's not restricted. They would just have to utilize it through the child care training application um, where they go and register. That's how you take the online course is through that system. Um, and for the instructor-led, if they're wanting to expand and go to the instructor-led avenue, through that system is where they registered and they find the listing of classes near them for that course. So Next. that's all of the questions. However, there are um, some hands raised, and I don't know if they're raised to ask a question or they inadvertently hit the key, but we want to go through and um, see if they want, if I need to unmute them and them ask a question. So we have an Isabel Afinorda. I'm sorry for um, messing up your last name, but your hand is raised, so I'm going to unmute you now. Isabel, did you have a question? You're unmuted. Thank you. Good morning. No ladies, you already answered to my question. Thank you so much. We're going to move on down to the next hand. We have a Kimberly Fribley Williams. I'm going to unmute you now, Kimberly. Good morning, Kimberly. Did you have a question? Kimberly Fribley Williams, did you have a question? Okay, we're going to move on from her. Let's move to the next hand raised. Next hand raised is Stephanie Simmons. I'm going to unmute you. Stephanie, you're unmuted. Did you have a question? Already answered. Thank you. Thank you so much. Susan Gage, we're going to unmute you. Good morning, Susan. Did you have a question? I do. Um, thank you guys for this wonderful presentation and all of the information and the resources that are coming out. They're very, very much needed and very, very much appreciated, especially up here in the Panhandle area. Um, quick question, though, kind of piggybacking on the training resources that we're providing for um, for our child care staff. I'm wondering um, if you guys are aware if OEL is trying to establish some, or, or maybe DCF or any of the entities really, ways to get actual supports beyond training in trauma-informed care to be able to be deployed or utilized in, um, again, I'm looking at a coalition perspective. So rather than just asking my providers or encouraging them or supporting them to go to training, can we get additional um, people into the, the child care classroom to help with these teachers? Yeah, I think that's a key question. Um, that's kind of what I was, uh, you said it so much uh, clearer. Um, I think that's one of the next steps is that ongoing, particularly mental health support um, that the staff needs to be able to respond appropriately to children and families and making that happen through coalitions at the local level. Okay. And Trika, you might or might not know, since I can recognize Yes, I, I was getting ready to speak, and uh, Joan started speaking. Um, and this is what I was going to speak to. So, you know, we've been putting a lot of time into developing a coaching. Um, I don't want to call it a network, but actually having coalitions to identify coaches who are basically um, – 
experts uh, in the field of early childhood education has probably served in several roles and capacities, but actually trained them to certify um, them as as coaches. And then we have identified several types of training so that they can go understand the content um, to be able to be a coach um, supporting the the educators, if you will, um, in whatever other content we send them through additional training to to be able to support educators with. Um, the issue that we're having, and I don't know that it's an issue, is, uh, but it is. The, and the reason I say that is coalitions have so many other roles. And so you all are really good about sending um, the coaches to receive the training, but then when it's actually time for them to go out and be able to actually do the training, they may be an assessor, your inclusion coordinator, your um, professional development person, your lead trainer. The And so when it's time now to go and actually be a coach and to coach, you have limited time to not only build that relationship, but what goes along with coaching with relationship is them being able to go out to observe, to model, to um, identify goals, to put action to that. And it's a whole process. Research shows that that process is the process that actually help providers with uh with behavior change and making sure we have lasting change more so than training. So I know that's why you're asking that. Um, but what happens with coalitions is if it's not required by standard statute rule or something that holds you to it, some coalitions may do it and some may not. So the short answer to your question is there's going to be more opportunities around trauma-informed care, infant mental health, for coaches to become trained. How you use those coaches when that happens um, is totally up to the coalition until um, some type of regulatory authority come into play. And I don't know that that will happen. So that's from OEL standpoint. And Trika, you read my mind exactly. Um, <laughs> all, <laughs> all the requirements, um, which are good requirements, take up a lot of time. And in a large geographical area coalition and smaller budget, it's just one of those, you know, trading off chicken and egg kind of things. So I appreciate your your response to that and look forward to anything that can help improve the lives of our youngest Florida citizens and their families. So thank you. Thank you so much for your question. You okay. know, this is, this is an oh, area, one again, I, I mean, I think we've got to really focus on, and that it was fascinating to hear that, you know, one of the challenges is you've got so many multiple roles when you're out there trying to do supervision and coaching. And so some states are moving to, you know, a dedicated set of specialists in, in mental health issues, in you know early childhood issues overall, that can work, that can spend the time in classrooms supporting teachers, sometimes funded by the the state through the child care dollars, sometimes supported by local foundations. But I think making this supervision and support a goal in the future is the next step beyond the trauma-informed care. Other questions, Trika? I am scrolling the questions feature. Okay, here's one. Um, it says, yes, we have had this request before. Additional support for child care staff come up repeatedly in our meetings. Almost 50 of children, let's see, 50, almost 50 of children, maybe they mean 50% of children, are coming in with ACEs. So I believe that's more of a comment. I actually have a question. Um, this is Jessica. Um, just I'm thinking about on the research side of things, um, particularly Sam and perhaps Aaron, when it comes to the trauma-informed uh, care project, is there monitoring going on 
Um, for example, we know that trauma impacts kids that are zero to five and, and often in a more profound way. So is there monitoring of um, staff that have had the training and the outcomes of their kids versus other kids that don't have staff that have gone through the training? Is that a part of the project? That that will be. We will be looking at outcomes um, and self-reporting from the child care providers as far as their expulsion rates um, and comparing with regards to who's got the training. But that is, um, we still think a few a year or so out um, mm -hmm. from us being able to pull back those outcomes and, and make a comparison to see if what we are doing through these projects has been successful or and helpful. So yes, that's something that we will look at doing at the um, in about a year. Okay. Great, and we do have a question. It says, does any of the training include information on the potential effects of prenatal substance exposure? You know, entry. I can't answer that question, but I will. Um, I will circle back with our curriculum. To, um, developers and and get an answer to that question for the group. This is Erin, not related to, to that training, but I do want to touch on the um, substance effective infants. We are doing a lot of work with our home visiting programs across the state around substance affected infants and their families. Um, as a result of federal legislation, um, infants born affected by substance misuse or substance use um, are required to um, at least have their families offered a plan of safe care. And a plan of safe care addresses the infant's needs, the needs of the mother and affected family members. And that plan can follow them uh, through multiple providers. And that's actually um, how it's envisioned, that the plan will continue to grow and be you know, um, amended or changed as needed or as the needs and issues of the family or child are identified. Uh, so that is something we're working on, on as a department uh, and also with our home visiting programs, hospital, hospitals across the state, um, Department of Health, and others. So just a little bit about the substance affected population. Other questions? Why don't we, um, <clears throat> in closing, uh, give each of the speakers, Erin, anything to add, Samantha, anything to add that you want to make sure people think about as we um, wait for other questions or think about next steps? You know, I would say, um, while my office works on policy and um, statutory changes uh, here at the statewide level, um, there's nothing like communication and local relationships. So if you have an opportunity to attend a CPI meeting, um, sometimes they have all staff meetings or a case manager meeting, um, and make some relationships. Explain to them what your program does or what, what's going on in your area. That's a great way uh, to get staff informed and also to put names with faces. So when there are concerns or issues, uh, folks know who to go to. That's a great point. I think a lot of people in the early childhood field may not know how, ch how child protection works in their community. So including right. that in, in early childhood training, <clears throat> you know, how does the system work? I, I think we need more um, <clears throat> exposure about each other's programming and so yeah absolutely um, you know you can call your local office and ask to speak to a supervisor or a program manager um, oftentimes they will come out uh, and do outreach efforts and come educate your staff on um, what's happening in your local area they'll be happy to do that um, we have positions across the department and in the regions who um, that those positions are dedicated to community outreach and educating uh, community partners. So absolutely, if there are, um, if there's information you want on a local level, reach out to your child, uh, child welfare partners. They'll be happy to come and speak with you. 
you know, it would be great at the state level if you could systematize that so that you kick off a series of local initiatives where we just get to know each other across the state. Um, I think it would be really beneficial and a leadership role that I think can be taken at the state level to encourage that in local communities. Very exciting. Jessica, any final comments from you? I think my just a few final comments are we are definitely, as Antrika said, going to send out an evaluation, but also resources. There are actually a, a lot of work done through the Child Welfare Information Gateway as far as research and articles on this topic in particular, the importance of merging these worlds in a more seamless way. And they also provide strategies and things like that. And we are certainly positioned um, at the state level, at least research-wise and training-wise, to try to um, implement some of these, some of the great advice that was brought forth today. So, thank you all for being on the on the call. Great. And please share with uh, other states what's going on in Florida. I think it's exciting to hear mm -hmm. and to learn from other states who are also dealing with this issue. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.